was a lot of people in hospital settings, so there's a coming out of the hospital and reintegrating back into day day to day life. So this is circa about 1900, 1880s, 1890s, 1900, 1910, uh, 100 years ago or so. These ideas were in the community. Okay, safety stabilisation, basic needs being met. One of the things I want to follow up there with is if we do really good crisis intervention, we wanted to get this, the sort of Damocles, as much as we can, removed from the person's head. Now that's difficult when there's courts pending and there's other things happening, the person's going to get evicted from their property, and there's other issues, the bikies are chasing you and you owe money to the, to the gangsters and so on. That's hard to get safety. But we're trying our best with financial counsellors, with legal supports, with housing, with uh, the police, or the justice system if necessary, um, with whatever we can do to do effective crisis intervention. That's a big part of complex trauma work. Our clients are always in one client crisis to another, to another, to another. That's the commonality of complex trauma living that you're in and out of crises. So as workers, effective crisis intervention, even though we may not be working for crisis intervention service, <laughs> but we still need to be able to respond to matters as quickly as we can, resolve matters, as, the pragmatic matters, as quickly as we can, such as housing, income, Centrelink, uh, legal stuff, uh, you know, significant matters. Effective crisis intervention <coughs> bonds the client with the worker. So here we have potentially good beginnings of attachment between worker and client. Clients who don't get effective intervention, but they just get an empathic worker. So the worker's empathic, a lot of compassion, but the client walks out and go, ah, oh, they listened to me, but they didn't give me anything. <laughs> so the, the crisis is still there. It was, it was nice to talk, but he, the, the worker, didn't do anything pragmatic to help. So we must be able to do pragmatic stuff in our crisis intervention. And par not paradoxically, but that bonds the client. Hey, I went to see this counsellor. He not only listened to me, he actually helped me. He gave me this and this and this, and we did this and this, and he called up this person, and we got this in the pipeline. I feel like I'm getting somewhere got a financial count. I never, I never knew about financial counsellors. Now I've got one. Wow. And there's no cost. <laughs> it's a good thing. Okay, so uh, effective crisis intervention, big part of the picture. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, as we mentioned, calming people, reducing distress, helping people feel safe, secure, identifying and assisting with current needs, establishing communications, Networks, okay. letting people know where you're at and how you are, identifying strengths, the, the way the person copes, and hope for them, getting people through the first period of high intensity and uncertainty, and supporting naturalistic recovery, which means you don't need to sort of talk to a psychologist. You just need to be with your friends and family and pets and in your cultural homeland or go to your church. Or do what you normally do to cope with stress. Naturalistic processes. Because they, they ruled out critical incident stress debriefing about 15 years ago in its mandated form. If people say, I want to debrief, well, that's okay. That's voluntary. But if you say, you must debrief, you've been exposed to something, you can't go home until you debrief, that's been ruled out. Mm -hmm. That was ruled out about 15 years ago. Because it's contagion, other people sharing horror, and people just need to be supported to go back home where they can and cope the way they normally cope. And then if they have ongoing issues, symptoms emerge, oh, give us a call, we're happy to talk to you, but we trust that if you just do your normal thing, we hope that we trust that you'll be okay. If not, after a week or so, give us a call. If you can't sleep, if you can't function, if you can't if you've lost all capacity, if you've lost all orientation, 
don't know if you're Arthur or Martha anymore, yeah, give us a call. We're, we're happy to come and support you. Interventions, no matter what they are, crisis intervention or not, and this is true of any stage of the counselling, when we're doing interventions with people, not only am I, am I trying to meet the immediate needs and to be pragmatic and as efficient as I can, okay, I'm also hoping that as I do this, I'm, tr I'm looking to see whether it's effective, not only pragmatically, but I'm also looking to see whether it's effective by calming the nervous system. You know, I told you, I said to you guys at the beginning of today, we track the outcome of what we do. We do something and we see what the client does with that. Does that make them worse? Does that calm them down? I'm not going to do stuff that makes them, you know, so we've got to get on to what settles them down. So this is where therapy and working with people is not all about pain. Because sometimes jumping into too much pain just makes the nervous system more agitated. Oh, tell me about your trauma history. Oh, yeah, you know. oh we'll get to that. We'll slow down, Tiger. We, we, we're trying to settle this nervous system as a priority. Hey, I'll tell you a story about one of my clients. Beautiful young lady. She was 27. She called me up on the phone. Said, Philip, <coughs> I'm looking for a new therapist, a new, a new psychologist. I said, okay, yeah, sure, no worries. And she said, without hesitation, yes, this is what's happened to me. So she's very quick, very forthright about telling me her story with no hesitation. And the story was, it's not a nice story. The story was two years ago when she was 25, she was raped. Okay, so that's the story. And then she tells me she's been in treatment for 12 months. Oh wow, okay, fantastic. 12 months of psychological care. She said the first six months were good, the last six months are not good. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, I'm happy to see you, but the first thing I do to check out is, but I'm a guy. That's the first thing I say, but I'm a guy. <laughs> is it okay for you to come and talk to a guy about such personal matters, and the client says, yeah, it's fine, me and my boyfriend get on well, I don't hate all guys, this is the, something that happened a couple of years ago with this guy, but I'm fine with working with guys, it doesn't matter. Now my guess is, with this, with this person, was that the 12 months of treatment was all exposure therapy. Every single session was exposure, that's my guess, I don't know if that's true or not, but that was my guess. <clears throat> now, I know my client's 27, and we make an appointment time, and a week later, this beautiful young person, young lady, comes into my office and sits down in the chair. Hey, nice to see you, welcome in. And I look up across at her, and I know she's 27, she was raped when she was 25, but when I look at her non-verbally, she looks like a terrified five-year-old. That's how she looks non-verbally terrified and about five. Okay? And I'm thinking about calming, settling the nervous system. I'm seeing a terrified, frozen inner child, a terrified, frozen young person inside this grown-up being, uh, lady. And so I say to her, oh, before we start, so she thinks we're not starting. And I know I'm right in the middle of doing stuff straight away. So I say, before we start, do you mind if we hop up and I'll just take you on a ticky tour and I'll show you where the, uh, where the stairwells are, where the lifts are, where the amenities are, where the tailor, the dressmaker, the, the jeweler is. I'll just take you on a ticky tour just to orient you to where we are. So, you know, you know how to get out, where the stairwell is, where the lifts are and so on. Because I'm on the ninth floor of a building in town up in Sydney. And she said, okay, she, so she thinks we're not starting therapy. And I think immediately I'm right in the middle of therapy. Because as soon as I get this person to stand up, I'm working with her nervous system. She doesn't know this. Okay? A, a sitting nervous system, Stephen Porges tells us, like a lying down nervous system, that's, a, that's very, very close to a frozen nervous system. And she looks frozen already. 
and the, and the, and the rule of counseling is 60 minutes sitting down. <laughs> That's the rule, it's implicit, but we don't tend to run a marathon doing counseling, do we? So it's a fairly consistent rule <laughs> that we tend to sit and talk for 55 or 60 minutes. So, but she looks frozen and she looks terrified and she looks about five. And she doesn't know it, but she just thinks we're going on a ticket tour to orient her to the place, which we are. But I'm also working my way through her nervous system immediately. Standing up is a higher order function of the nervous system compared to sitting down. This is more of a limbic system, movement system. What we saw in Porges, freeze, fight or flight, movement. That's a higher order system. So we go for a little ticky to a walk around, now we're in a movement system. And we're chatting, walking side by side, chatting, oh here's the stairwell, and there's the lifts, and there's the tailor, and there's the dressmaker, oh there's the amenities there, the ladies that side, men over there. And after five minutes we come back to the uh, entrance of my suite. And I say to her, oh we're back here. Hey, um, do you feel comfortable where we're at and with me, do you feel like, it's so you, you be in charge. Should we go in or should we go for another walk? What would you like to do? And now she's going to be in charge. What would you like to do? And she said, no, I feel comfortable with you. I feel, I feel like I know where I'm at, how to, where the lifts are and all that. I feel, I feel pretty good actually. So we go into the room and we sit down and I look up at her and now she looks like a 20 something year old person. Mm -hmm. No more terrified, five, frozen, all of that's gone into the background or dissipated. This person seems to be more grown up and more functional. You settle the peripheral system, you go up in the central nervous system. You get higher levels of capacity when you calm the body. Calm the peripheral nervous system, the mind gets clearer. Better thinking, better decision making, better reasoning. Calm the nervous system, get better choices being made. So my client's out, um, sat down, and she's looking like a 20-something year old person now. And then I, doing another intervention, I say, oh, oh, oh I know that you've done those other counselling before, but we don't have to do anything, zero, like what you've done before. Then I say, what do you want to do? I'm brand new, this is brand new. You tell, you tell me what you would like. Which is like, oh, heresy for psychology. Because psychology is meant to be telling people all about themselves. I'm not that sort of psychologist. I want this person to lead the process. What would you like from this work that we're going to do? And she says, Philip, quote unquote, I just like to be normal. Okay, so we explored all things about normality. We didn't touch on the rape. We got this beautiful, vibrant, healthy, normal person back. This beautiful, vibrant, healthy, normal person didn't even get a look in in 12 months of therapy. It was all about your trauma victim. What, 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 but she's not. That's just an experience. That's not her identity. But it became her identity in the treatment. And it wasn't helpful. People are human beings. People need to have fun. People need to not be labelled. I know there's an argument for labels, but I don't want to debate that. But anyway. <coughs> Interventions must at least in part be aimed at calming the nervous system. Um, Miriam Rose on Gum Mer Borman, deep listening. Uh, our Aboriginal brothers and sisters have really got this beautiful Dadiri <coughs> counseling system. Just being able to be present and listen. And let the client share and I will follow. So deep listening to Deary. Okay, so that's a big big part being able to listen and listen deeply to our clients and their experience. And empathize and be compassionate and so on. All the Rogerian stuff, unconditional positive regard, um, empathy, congruency, and so on. And me, as a worker, and I've said to you guys, you know, we're trying to be 
the client has a right to be wherever they are, but I'm trying to keep an eye on the present moment. Well, what's happening with this person in the present moment? What do they need in the present moment? What can we do in the present moment? So the client has the prerogative to be or to live wherever their attention is, past, present, or future. The therapist, however, in this slide says, committed to the present, helping the client learn, attend, and care for their present moment experience. We're learning to be present. A lot of complex trauma is about not being present. That's what, oh, that's what I was going to say before and I forgot. You, you, you avoid being present. You, you don't avoid trauma. You avoid reality. You avoid this present moment. And quite often I make a joke at this point and say, well, you know, with Anthony Albanese and Scott Morrison, <laughs> you know, we, we, we don't want to be too much in this present reality, you know. So um, people avoid the present moment, avoid the present reality. They can only take so much of it, little bits of it at a time. So I'm wanting to help my clients have little bits of enjoyment, not just insight and emotional processing and painful stuff and work, working through, but something that they feel good about being present for, that they enjoy coming to therapy, that they enjoy coming to see a therapist or, or a mental health clinician because there's something yes you're helping with the problems yes it's painful but there's also moreover there's something really nice that this person is helping you with so quite often I'll be commenting about how, what a beautiful day it is look at the beautiful jacaranda that's flowering out there and look at the beautiful Morton Bay and the, the and how shady and, 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 and the blue sky you know and the animals and the pets and the greenery and the you comment a lot of nature is a very, very big ally for us in helping people be more present. The more comfortable present they become, the less heroin they need, the less ice they need, the less alcohol they need, the less self-harming they need. They're comfortable in their own skin present. They don't need to get out of it. They don't need to get away from it. They can stay present. We're helping them little bits up with that. So we sort of made this point when a child grows up in complex developmental trauma, the trauma that the child experiences becomes synonymous with reality. So subsequently most clients later in life don't necessarily present with trauma issues per se. Rather they have difficulties that are reflective of struggles with reality. With things in reality. With being here and I have to say at this point that you can go from one extreme to another and poor old psychiatry goes to the other extreme. It doesn't like delusions. <laughs> it doesn't like people living in pretend. I'm fine with delusions and I'm fine with people living in pretend so long as they choose to do it. If it's automatic, if they're hijacked by it, if they don't have control.